you're such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is the solved case of the client who killed his therapist. Now, this is also the Catherine Flahe case, and it's one that will baffle you in many ways. I mean, nothing seems to add up, and when you finally get some answers, it just leads to more questions, and the more complicated the truth Gets. Now, why did this therapist with such a beautiful soul have to be taken from this earth? And was there really a motive? And by the way, it's my absolute passion to tell these stories. And if you would like to support me in doing so, all you have to do is make sure you're subscribed, give this video a thumbs up, and leave a nice comment down below. Now let's get back to the story. It was 2008 in New York and Catherine Fahey lived with her husband, Walter Adam, in Upper East Side, New York. And they had been together for 25 years. They had such a beautiful life together. Catherine was 56 years old at this time and she had the deepest passion for mental health. She had actually gone to school for developmental psychology and she had gotten her doctorate at the Fairkoff Graduate School. She had actually written her dissertation on the role that parents had have in what their children adopt later on and she was just an extremely smart individual. She went on to teach at the St. Peter's College for quite a while for about four years while she was building the you know the money and planning out her own private practice that she wanted to start pretty soon. At this time Catherine was also using her time to develop programs for families and caregivers at this residential health care facility on Staten Island and she was just such a caring, compassionate woman who was so kind-hearted and had such a pure spirit about her. She dedicated her whole life to helping people overcome traumas and hardships any way she could. I mean, her clients were treated as though they were her children, her loved ones, and she cared so deeply for each one of them and they knew that and they felt the same way about her, you know? It's hard to find a therapist that you mesh well with that you feel truly cares about you and when you do, you hold on tight to them and that is what all of her clients did. Now, a psychologist wasn't all that Catherine was. She was actually beautifully artistic and she loved to be creative. She actually played guitar and her and her husband would go every single summer to this guitar camp. And this was like for 10 years that they had done that. Catherine also loved to paint with watercolors and she had sort of an obsession with Paris. And every single vacation they could go on, they actually rented a small apartment in Paris and would bicycle around just to see the whole city and the environment and really just spend as much time as they could there. She definitely had a caregiver's role for, for as long as anyone could remember. She had six siblings. She was always really good and really close with them. They were Kevin, Owen, Mary, Eileen, Michael, and Bernadette, and they were all just extremely close and well bonded. And as she grew up, Catherine was just even more of a welcoming, articulate woman who was just so pleasant to be around. She was filled with love and understanding. And by 2008, she had actually practiced psychology for over 20 years at that point and was still loving it. She had her own practice, she was helping patients, and her specialties were actually cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as, you know, dealing with relationship issues and relationship therapy and stuff like that. And she would actually get to walk across the street from her apartment to her offices and sit down at her dream desk to begin her day and her life was literally all she had ever dreamed of and she just truly seemed to not be overlooking what she had gotten in this life and she was very thankful and she just took every moment she could and made a good thing out of it. Sadly, her life would not have a happy ending, and on February 12th of 2008, the police would be called to the 78th Street building, and this was because two people were said to be hurt. This was 70-year-old Dr. Kent Scheinbach, who also worked with Catherine as one of the psychologists, and Catherine was hurt as well. When investigators got there, Dr. Steinbach was immediately sent to the hospital. He was in critical condition. He had stab wounds in his hands and his head on his face. 
And once they got him out of the room, they realized that Catherine was lying still in a pool of blood near her desk on the tan carpet and she had been stabbed 15 times in the head, face, and chest. They realized that she had already passed away. Now, this crime scene was unlike any other. I mean, you hear that a lot in these cases, but this is one that looked like a butcher shop and they were blood, there was blood everywhere and there were things thrown around like a tornado had hit. Two steak knives were found near her body that were bent because of how much force was used to stab her and there was also a meat cleaver that had a dislodged handle and a bent blade because it had been used so roughly and it was actually found that her cause of death was blunt force trauma to the back of her skull. Once Dr. Scheinbach was questioned when he was well enough to speak and had recovered a bit, he would say that that night he was in his office with a, another patient and he had heard some thumping and some moans coming from Catherine's office and he went to make sure she was okay and he kind of knocked on the door, called out her name, but she didn't answer and that's when he twisted the door knob and he went inside and he would see her bleeding next to her desk lying still and he kind of said you know what happened and that is when he would hear in a low growl behind him she's dead and he would be hit over the head he would be shoved against the wall and his wallet would be taken from him as well as the 90 dollars that was inside and at this point, he believed he was going to be killed too, and he was fighting with everything he had, but he didn't know how to escape, and the man would slash him in the face and would continue to pin him against the wall using a chair, and this man would say his name was Michael Brownstein, and, but also say, can I have a place to stay and to eat, and it was just very confusing for Dr. Scheinbach, but that is when he would say that he now had Dr. Scheinbach's license and knew where he lived. And he also asked for his PIN number. And Dr. Scheinbach decided to give him a fake one and not give him a real one. His card wasn't even in the wallet, so he didn't know how this man thought he was going to get money, but he gave him a false one. And this man, this killer, had said that he was going to go down to the ATM and if he found out that he was lying, he would go to his house and kill his wife. The police would get there before this killer would return, thankfully, and there had been another person in the office at the time. Remember, Dr. Scheinbach was actually in the room with another patient when this all happened, and she would come forward saying that she had gone because she had heard, you know, screams and a struggle after Dr. Scheinbach had gone in there, and she had gone to kind of listen, and she heard all of this happening, and she was like walking to the waiting room, and then this attacker would come out of the room, and they were standing face to face in the waiting room, and that was when he would shove her into a bathroom. But Thankfully, before he could do anything further, she kneed him in the groin and he kind of recoiled and then he started to run for the basement exit. And that is when she would lock the door so he could no longer get back in. She would call the police and when they would arrive, they would immediately find two black luggage bags and inside they would find six steak knives, rope, and duct tape as well as women's clothes and diapers. Now they weren't exactly sure about all of these items in the bag and what they were really doing there, but this did show that the attacks had been planned and that this attacker had probably scoped out the building prior to this and had Catherine in mind. That is when they would get the surveillance footage back and they would see a bald, round-faced, middle-aged man walking into the building with these two black suitcases at about 8 p.m. He was walking in from the freezing rain and he would go to the doorman, Francisco, and he would say he was there to meet with Dr. Scheinbach. And so the doorman, you know, let him in, let him upstairs, and he was wearing a green overcoat and sneakers at this time, and he would go upstairs to the waiting room. He would sit next to this blonde girl and 
they would have a little bit of small talk and then Dr. Scheinbach would come out and get this girl, bring her back to the office and the man would sit there for a while before getting up and going towards Catherine's door. That's when he would go inside and they would sit there talking for 19 minutes before he would pull out a meat cleaver. He would start to hit her with it and he would attack her until it broke and at that point he brought out his nine inch knife and did the same with that. When Dr. Scheinbach got there, he struggled with this man for 10 minutes before he ran outside to go to the ATM and then he would leave blood on the basement door. This woman the man had been talking to on the couch was the same woman that he would later attack before being locked out of the building and she had gotten quite a good look at his face so the police sent her to a sketch artist who could make this picture, this description of this man and send it out everywhere and it was said this man had been in the building for 59 minutes total. However, he was found on surveillance footage outside the building at 6.30, like two hours before he'd actually gone in, but he had went in the building several times starting at 6.30, but he never went to the office until 8. The only lead investigators had at this point was their own theories and they believe this is possibly a client of one of the psychologists at this private practice. There were five of them there so they believed it was possibly one of their clients or one of their clients spouse husband, relative in some way. They didn't know the motive, but they did know that this was an angry, violent crime and the problem was that to get any information was going to be hard because of patient doctor confidentiality and you know you can't just pick up the records and read them if you want you're gonna have to get a subpoena for those it was thought that if this was one of Catherine's patients that had caused this or you know been the reason for this that this was possibly one of her clients boyfriends because she mainly worked with women. That is all they really had to go on at this point before they could get into the records and they also decided to station a whole bunch of police officers around all of Dr. Scheinbach's relatives because there had been that threat made and he was still recovering in the hospital. Dr. Scheinbach's wife had actually come to the private practice that night when all of this was happening because she had this weekly date night she had with her husband and he didn't show up and so she just came to the offices to see what was wrong to see if he was just running late and that's when she would see crime scene tape and police cars and nobody was talking to her. She was asking, is my husband okay? Did he die? You know, nobody was telling her anything and she started screaming, my husband, my husband, my husband and finally someone came over and said, he's fine, he's going to be coming down soon and he did. He was bandaged, he was still bleeding but he was going to be going to the hospital in critical condition but he was going to be okay at least they thought and so they headed to the hospital and Catherine's husband Walter was actually there as well he had seen all of this commotion of course because they lived across the street and he rushed over and he didn't know what to do he started to demand to know what was going on that this was his wife's private practice and she was supposed to be home and finally they told him that she wasn't doing well and they asked him to give them a list of people he believed would have wanted to harm her or anything that he could give them and he sat down he did this and it wouldn't be until later that he was told she had already passed. A woman who lived in the building that was neighboring this private practice came forward saying that she heard yelling outside just at about 8 p.m. and it was a male screaming, no one is helping me, no one is helping me. And she didn't know who it was or what was happening, but when she looked outside, the man was gone. And they figured that maybe this had something to do with the killing and they tried to put a profile together of what this killer could be like and what could have caused him to do this and you know they came up with a few things but they had more questions than anything and they had no clue what to really look for or why there was women's clothing and adult diapers in the bags. They speculated maybe it showed some signs of motherhood issues, something that was brought up in therapy with one of these therapists that he didn't like and that 
caused him to have this outrage. This was yet another mystery in this unsolved case and at Catherine's funeral she would have so many people there that there was barely standing room and at one point during one of the speeches from her friends she turned and looked at the casket of Catherine and just started clapping and said well done for everything she had done in her life for every person she had helped and everybody in the room stood up and started clapping too because this is how much of an impact Catherine made in her lifetime that was cut far too short. Fingerprints were taken from the luggage as well as blood samples from the room. There was so much blood they wanted to make sure that if the killers was there as well that they were going to find it but they weren't able to identify this killer so far. It was going to take quite a bit and they weren't having any luck so far but they had gotten the subpoenas for the search warrants for the records and they were going through them with a fine tooth comb. I mean, they were looking through everything possible, her calendar, her electronic calendar, any possible emails she had. They did this with Dr. Scheinbach as well and also asked him to call anybody he thought would have any information or that could help them in any way. And now they had names, but they didn't know where to start because there were so many names and so many possibilities and they just had to get to work knowing it was going to take quite a long time. And at this point, even though they had the records, the forensic evidence was actually looking more likely to get them an identification because there was so much of it. And if they just found the right piece, it would bring everything together. Meanwhile, they had found their first suspect. He was a 42-year-old named William Kunzman, and he had a connection to Catherine. They just weren't sure exactly what that was yet. You see, William had been emailing Catherine and calling her that day, talking that, about the fact that his problems were only getting worse, and there was more of them happening. And then it was found that William and Catherine were actually friends. They had met at one of the guitar camps she went to every year, and Catherine had you know, started talking to him about the fact that she was a therapist, that she, you know, dealt with all different types of trauma and just hardships. And he kind of started to rely on her as someone to help him out. And although he had never been to a meeting or into her office, he had emailed her quite a lot asking her for help. He would be arrested and would be questioned for eight hours. I mean, he would ask for a lawyer. He would talk but he didn't really seem to know anything and investigators really didn't know if he was connected at all. They did bring in Dr. Scheinbach to pick him out of a lineup. Dr. Scheinbach actually picked out William but it was strange because William looked so incredibly different than the man on the security footage. William was this curly haired man with a ton of hair. He was super thin and on the cameras it looked like this man was balding and had kind of a rounder face, a rounder body. And so they didn't really see the similarities but Dr. Scheinbach said it was him. However, they brought the client of Dr. Scheinbach's who had come face to face with this killer in to see if she would identify him as well and she said that he wasn't in the room. They didn't have anything to connect William to this case so they did release him but they were going to keep an eye on him for quite some time, especially until this case was solved. Four days after the murder, that is when the fingerprint results would come back in and a 39-year-old man would be arrested at his queen's apartment at 5.30 in the morning. His name was David Tarloff and he would be arrested but this didn't clear anything up for Catherine's friends and family because they didn't know who he was. They almost figured that they would know either <clears throat> one of her clients or he would be connected in some way that would bring them some clarity almost immediately, but now they just had a man in custody that was said to be connected to these bags found at the crime scene but not connected to Catherine in any way. Some believe this wasn't the right guy and that forensics somehow got it wrong or that, you know, his fingerprints were previously on the bag, but they weren't the killer's hands. And that is when they would get him in for questioning. He would talk for 35 minutes and by then, they already had a confession. Throughout talking to him, they had to wake him up several times. He kept falling asleep or dozing off and he would also ask for a sandwich but was super indecisive about what kind he wanted and eventually they would get him to say that he had 
just planned to get money. That's all he wanted. He was going to go in, he was going to tie him up, he was going to hit him, and he was going to rob him. He did all this because he believed he was rich. But who was he? We were talking about Catherine here, and he started talking about a man. Well, that is when he would say that Dr. Scheinbach was the original target. The man he had said as he walked into the building that he was going to see, he admitted that he was his target, yet he was still alive. David said he was tired of waiting for Dr. Scheinbach and so he was walking around and he peeked into the office next door and that's when he saw Catherine and he said she attacked him. He didn't know what to do. He didn't want to harm her. He wished she wasn't there. Now I'm going to answer some footage of him actually confessing all of this because I feel like you get more of his personality and who he is hearing it from him. This never happens. Before. Well, I can't I imagine that it has. 21 times. Right. So I didn't go there. All I wanted was to get money from him. I probably, I thought he was rich, so I could go there, get his money, I was going to leave him there, I had this hammer, I was going to hit him, I was like, man, I didn't want to hurt him, I was going to tie him up and scare him, but I didn't know that he was going to be there, I went to it because I heard a noise and I just wanted to go in and look, and she attacked me, everything happened so fast, I swear to God, I was just going to tie him up, tape him up, shut the door, go, I didn't know anything, I was going to take his card, I even begged him for the number. I wrote it down, but he had a seven-digit number or something, and I know the account was a four-digit account. He wouldn't tell me. I tried to leave. I did. I left. I, I wasn't in I didn't want that lady. To shoot. I thought she was going to kill me. I just, I didn't know what to do. I, everything happened fast, I swear to God. And I left him there. I had it. I was, I was going like this. I was just trying to scare him. Give me the money. Give me, uh, yeah. I, I saw his picture, so I said, I, I, I never thought about money, and I swear to God and that he wouldn't tell me anything. So then, I was tired, I didn't want to hurt the guy. Then I knew there was somebody there talking to him, and I heard some noise, and then I said, I was scared, maybe you should call the police. So I threw everything in, I read. I said, listen, this guy's, he's no good, he's a man, I just want my please go. And she wouldn't, let's go in the bathroom, she would, I was got her. She, I, I don't know her name, she was a blonde girl, brown. So then, I, I was going back home and she started kicking me. So then I heard my eh. So then I ran. I didn't know what I was going to do. I wanted to go to Hawaii with this money. I never was going to touch it. I thought, go to Hawaii, my mom would rest. I mean, my mother would get better. I packed stuff for her, diapers and everything, to take her away. I wasn't, I swear to God, I, you could, I'll, I never have a misdemeanor. I had parking tickets as a kid. I lived in that building for 40 years. The worst thing I did was asking people for a few dollars because I was, I was on the drugs. But I never stole. I paid for it. My brain was tired. I found it accidentally. The medication was so hard to get. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that woman. I, I didn't know her. I didn't know she was going to be there. I called to make sure that he was going to be there. I didn't know. I thought it was his own office. I didn't know any. I called Gracie Square. This is his office. I wrote it down. I went. I knocked on the door just to see if anyone was going to be there. I know his last one was 8 o'clock. I said, do you know where the bathroom is? The secretary goes, I, I just wanted to, I feel it. She said, yes, you left. And I left. And then I waited in the bathroom and I heard everybody leave. I swear to God, I heard everybody leave because I, I wasn't going to hurt anybody. Please, please remember this. I swear to God, on my mother's life, you have a mother, I swear to God. And then... That's it. I'm sorry. This is when he would go into why he was robbing Dr. Scheinbach in the first place. He would also go into a bit of a rant about the fact that his mother was being mistreated and that he needed to take her out and take her to Hawaii for her to get better, which is why he had women's clothes and diapers. He would also say he had no clue Catherine was there and that he believed this building was only for Dr. Scheinbach. Now, 
I do have to add that his mother was in a nursing home at this time and wanting nothing to do with David, but he continued to try to get into the nursing home, to call her and cuss her out all the time, and she had a protective order against him. But if this was all the truth, why Dr. Scheinbach? Why was he supposed to be the one targeted? I mean, if he was looking for a rich man, he went after a psychologist for $50,000, but I'm sure there are much more rich individuals in New York City, why was he targeted? Well, to tell you that, I'm gonna have to go into David's past a little bit more. You see, growing up, he was a pretty well-adjusted child. He was smart, he was a stud in high school, but then during his first semester of college, when he had been about 20 years old, he completely changed. He started having meltdowns and changes and his appearance was just no longer being taken care of and it was like a complete 180. These changes would be elaborated on and kind of explained and diagnosed in the future, but at this moment, they really didn't know what was happening with David. He was breaking down all the time. He was running around naked. He was screaming constantly. He would flush the toilet over and over and over again. He would refuse to change his clothes, refuse to get out of the shower, and just like almost reverted back to a childlike version of himself in a way but much stronger. For the next two decades, he would be in and out of different, you know, seeing different doctors and therapists and out of different facilities, getting different medications. And by 2001, he was officially seeing the psychologist who would diagnose him with schizophrenia and would also get him institutionalized at this mental health facility. And this was the first time he had really been given a name for what he was struggling with. This psychologist would be none other than Dr. Scheinbach. First time David had ever been told what was going on with his head. Dr. Scheinbach hadn't recognized him after all these years during the attack. I'm sure his adrenaline was going. He wasn't really paying attention to that. And he would realize later on that that was his ex-patient. Now, David would say during the time period he was diagnosed that his brain was falling apart, that he saw the eye of God on the kitchen floor. I mean, he believed his brain was talking to him as the devil and he was the Messiah. He would often call up his brother like 50 times at a time to tell him all of this that he was seeing. Every single poster on the wall was a sign from God to him and it was said to be a sort of obsession with this religion formed with delusions and by 2008 he was actually fixated on his mother and believing that this nursing home the far rockaway nursing home was doing horrendous things to her making her sit in her own feces and he believed he needed to kidnap her and get her out but the only problem was he didn't have money to do so, so he was gonna rob his old therapist to get back at him. He believed he had God's blessing for this plan, and when he saw Catherine, he said he believed she was associated with Scheinbach in his malevolent ways. He kind of thought of him as an evil person. He underwent psychiatric evaluation and would be found competent to stand trial. This would be for premeditated murder as he had packed bags, he had called ahead of time for office hours, and he had also been in and out of the building several times throughout, you know, the hours prior to the actual killing. And he would plead guilty, but his defense would, of course, try to prove that he was not sane at the time of the killing. The first trial would be in 2010, and the jury would tell the judge several times that they could not decide. And so eventually, it of course was a hung jury. And the same thing happened in 2003 at the next trial. And so in May of 2014, the official trial would be held. and. At this point, David would be in the courtroom, you know, grabbing for the air and blowing kisses and mumbling to himself. And as usual, David's defense was saying that he was not in a sane state of mind, that he believed that God was speaking to him and he had many delusions. But the prosecution said that yes, David had mental health issues and he was obsessed with religion, but he knew between right and wrong and he knew what it meant to put a knife in someone's chest. A month later, David would be found guilty and sentenced to life without parole for the murder of Catherine and also given 25 to life for the assault of Dr. Scheinbach. And the jury had agreed this time that although he was ill, 
he did have a plan and he wasn't just doing this because you know the devil made him do it he was going after the money and he had that motive even though the motive for Catherine's actual murder couldn't be really figured out because he wasn't originally going for her, but he had gone in with the intent to kill. David pleaded in court for a non-guilty verdict. He said there was a constant battle in his head and said, I'm deeply sorry to you all and everybody else for what had happened. I believe in obeying the law, but that night I had a thought coming through into my head that I interpreted as coming from God. God said your mother is going to die unless you kill Dr. Scheinbach. I didn't want to do this, I swear to God, but I thought all the bad things were going to happen. Now this case caused a huge conversation regarding mental health professionals and their safety. And I think at the same time, we also need to put in the families of these individuals and think about you know their safety as well and by no means am i saying that anyone with schizophrenia or any sort of mental illness is a killer and in fact i think that people with mental illness are the bravest strongest people and the most beautiful people honestly like they they struggle with so much more than the average person and that by no means makes them a monster makes them the opposite a lot of the times they become the purest most helpful people and so that's not what i'm saying at all however it's different when it comes to those with homicidal thoughts that is when those extra steps need to be taken to make sure they are safe from themselves and the world is safe from them the mental health professionals are safe from them their family is safe from them i mean david was released from psychiatric centers time and time again and not for good behavior not because he was doing better but because paperwork had been lost for the years they didn't know how many times he had been in and out and how much he had really been going through or you know his homicidal thoughts or anything he was dealing with. They just didn't know even who he was. They just saw him as a patient that was there for a while, seemed fine, and they let him go. Every time he would stop taking his antipsychotic medications when they weren't giving it to him, and he would, as soon as he was released, basically need to go back in, and it happened every single time. David would have breakdowns often when he was out of the psychiatric centers, and he would have paranoid delusions. He was seen by neighbors just kind of walking around, half naked, mumbling to himself, and they said he was pretty erratic and combative. And basically his mother had been through so much with him that she feared him, and she didn't want to see him and that didn't stop him. He was going to kidnap her if he had got that money and take her to Hawaii if he could get through with it. And this is what ultimately led to murder. He was willing to murder somebody for it. You know, I've seen firsthand that these facilities will release individuals not for the fact that they are doing any better, but for the fact that they don't have any money or resources or the means to continue helping them. So they say, I'm sorry. There's nothing else we can do. You're not getting any better. We have to let you go. That is the opposite of what we should be doing. You know, there needs to be a system where these individuals can get further help and not just dumped on the street to either get worse or be in the same spot they were before they went in or, you know, in the, in the same spot that they currently are because they never really got any help throughout the whole process. They were just drugged, stuck in a room and not helped. And I think the problem is there's so much happening that a lot of professionals don't know what to do. Now, an employee at one of the hospitals that David was at said that he was by far one of the worst cases that he's ever worked with, but David was not found guilty by reason of insanity. He was found guilty and he was sent to jail. Do you believe that this was the right choice? He had actually been ruled mentally incompetent to stand trial twice before they could actually go through with the trial, but he did have a plan to commit this crime. However, did he really? Because his whole plan was about Dr. Scheinbach and he could never really say why he murdered Catherine other than she tried to attack me. Why would she try to attack him if he just walked in the room? I can't see that happening. Did he murder her because he was so fixated on Dr. Scheinbach and when he saw Catherine there and knew she was there, he felt like he had to get rid of her to get to him? Was she a threat or was she just an easy target that he could get to first? I mean, Catherine wasn't asked for the money. It didn't seem like he'd wanted from Dr. Scheinbach. She was just brutally murdered for no reason. There, I just feel like there has to be more to this story than 
He just went in there, talked to her for 19 minutes about what, and then killed her. I mean, did he confess and then figured he had to take her life because he did so? Because she would be a witness? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Catherine's family is now grateful for the justice, but it does nothing to bring back their beloved Catherine. And, you know, she was dedicated to helping others and she was never really fearful of her job because, of course, people with mental health problems, people with mental illness, they're not to be feared. They're to be, you know, they're to be looked at as the warriors and the fighters they are. And, you know, you hope that you can help people in any way as a mental health professional, I'm sure. And a lot of the times, you know, if there are people with those homicidal thoughts, they would get them the help that they need. She knew protocol. She knew what to do. She didn't fear these people. She only wanted to help them. And it breaks my heart that the very thing she loved to do was the very thing that ended her life. I mean, she was a beautiful person inside and out. One of her previous clients had actually said that she had told her that she was actually going to school as an x-ray technician, but she decided to move it to psychotherapy because she wanted to fulfill her need to give. Why this pure soul was taken from the world, we still don't know. And I think all we can do now is make sure that we are giving lots of love to those who help those who struggle. So the therapists, just the caregivers, the the people who just show you that you are worthy of that love, that support you, protect you, and love you because those are often the ones that don't get a lot of thought as to if they're okay. And you know in this situation she didn't have control over it but I think that that is something that is very important and I think we just really need to respect them more and respect the people that use their heart and their empathy for good and to help others with it in a world that is very selfish. I also do want you guys to know this whole case revolves around a therapist, but we didn't really talk about therapy much. And I do want you to know that Getting help is something that can be very scary and I completely understand that and you almost feel like I'm strong enough without it. I don't need it. I can do this on my own. I've been fighting for so long. I can continue fighting. Sometimes you shouldn't have to continue fighting by yourself and I think that the mindset really needs to change from I'm weak if I have to ask for help to I'm stronger because not only would you then have your strength, you would have, you know, the therapist strength to help you as well and you would work together to overcome things and you might even learn something new you didn't know before and I am a huge advocate for therapy and for getting help even if it's scary and even if you don't think you're that bad because you may learn that what you're thinking isn't normal even if you thought it kind of was and that it's not okay to be feeling like that all the time. I think Catherine would be so incredibly happy if any of you out there got the help you deserve and I'm sure that Catherine would have even continued helping people and, be, and being a therapist if she would have survived because she is just that kind of woman and and I just hope that you guys know how passionate I am about mental health. I mean, before I was doing true crime, I was doing short films about mental health. I don't know if you guys have seen any of those, but I did like little cringy short films about it. But it's just, it's a big passion of mine and I think Catherine's story deserved to be told. I'd love to know if you think that David should have gotten the insanity plea. I can see why he didn't but I can also see why he should have. So yeah, don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.